the Cutting Edge is just honored to have uh, with him one of our founders of the Cutting Edge. Uh, was Without your help, Bob Dornan, there would be no Cutting Edge, I can honestly say that. As a result, uh, your opponent in this race, in this primary race, said that it would be an unfair advantage if we were to interview him. So I just thought he'd let you know that right off the top. You wouldn't edit him? No. There's a camera, here he would be, he could speak his mind and his convictions, and they'd run in continuity. All right. Let's, let's, I would insist on that as a founder of Cutting Edge. Let, let, <laughs> let, me, let me start this off properly. I, I think uh, when you talk about someone that's uh, been cursed and blessed by all of America, you can look under Bob Dornan and find his picture because uh, I, you have no people in the gray zone. They all have uh, either they really love you or else they just don't like you at all. Right. Now, recently, uh, you went back to your talk show, but I think people forget something that's really important about Bob Dornan. You know, in the old days, we just got Wally George just passed away yes. recently. The before Wally George was Sam Yorty. Oh, yes. And uh, the before Sam Yorty was Joe Pine. But right there... Doing both between, well. But right there in between was Bob Dornan, right in the midst of, uh, of all of this... Uh, so-called shock and awe, television right. and radio. And uh, at that point in time, I mean, there was no Bill O'Reilly, there was no Hannity and Combs, there was no Chris Matthews. That's right. There was just Bob Dornan. So uh, you served 18 years you know, for the Congress of this United States. And uh, then you retired in 98 after all the ta-da in the, in the Congress. And you went out with, like we'd always expect yeah. you to go out with a little controversy attached. Swinging, going that's, down, that's fighting, exactly right. right. Well, here it's been what since '98, and all of a sudden you're back in town. So tell me the tell me the story of all of the congressional districts and all the Republicans that are right. up for running. Right. Why did you choose Huntington Beach and uh, the Palos Verdes area and uh, and uh, this particular district? Okay, a little, little uh, prologue on some biography history. Joe Pine fighting Marine from World War II, left his leg in the Pacific. Uh, Joe Pine had me at a show once. How will I ever forget the day to change my life? Halloween, 1964, I debated the head of the Nazi party. Uh, Lincoln, what's his name? George Lincoln Rockwell, ex-naval officer, but he disgraced his white Navy uniform. And I, I went in what Joe Pine called the dock. And I said, I see you're wearing a diamond swastika. And he had a stick pin ugly looking thing about diamonds and I said now tell me about General Lahausen and Admiral Canaris and what they exposed about the evil of the Hitler gang he got all excited and said uh, well, where did you get that what do you know about that you're too young to know about that and I said oh I'm touching the wrong buttons right because you are a member by extension of that evil Hitler gang he went ballistic when the show was over Joe Pine says hey kid where did you come from I was 30 looking uh, 20 and his producer, Bill Gates, says, you want a talk show? I'm not kidding. That's simple. You want a talk show? And he gave me a talk show at KTTV. And I would have been the youngest talk show host in America, I guess, on TV. And the Air Force activated me, put me back in new captain's uniform, sent me in my rescue seaplane down to Santa Domingo. It was the Santa Domingo crisis. And I was stuck down there for three months. And Louis Lomax got my show, Lord rest his soul. But he brought me on as his co-host. And that kind of led to a broadcasting career. Now, the other guy, Yorty, he used to come on my show, and then he and Betts would take me out to dinner. What a great guy. The last of the great conservative Democrats. And uh, he was a lovable guy. And all those years in between, doing the Temple Show, four hours live every day in the L.A. Orange County and Ventura Market, and then the Robert K. Dornan Show live on Saturday night before that was a show's name, 90 minutes, and I would assign myself to Vietnam eight times, Laos, the Middle East, Israel, all over the world, ten times behind the Iron Curtain. I was my own producer, and I would pay out of my bank account for me to go anywhere in the world and come back with these stories. That was a great show. Emmys all those years. And it was all a plan, million to one odds. It only worked because of the grace of God to run for Congress in 76. And I was lucky enough to win on my first go around. All right. What, let's come on now. Okay. We've got now, a, lot, okay. a lot of things okay. to ask. Just you. want to give a little, a little biography. Uh, so that 20-year that, that, that 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 run, <laughs> six in L.A., 12 in Orange County. Uh, let me quote the current chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Bob Dornan took a simple uh, congressional seat and turned it into a national platform. 
So when I left, of course everybody predicted whether they liked me or disliked me, I'd end up on talk radio. And then I began to track a guy that I'd served with. The whole eight years, Rohrbacher and I served together, I was on the House Intelligence Committee. And I was going on classified trips, and a lot to the Middle East. I had no idea he was going on these renegade, rogue, freebooting, silly, asinine missions, uh, paid for with terrorist money to all of these areas of the world and becoming not first a nuisance to the State Department, then an aggravation, and then a threat to U.S. foreign policy. And I thought, what is going on here? And I said, Sally, do you remember when he almost got down on his knees in Duncan Hunter's office, harangued me for three hours and made me come back the next day for another three hours, begging me to give him the safe <coughs> Huntington Beach seat, to give it to him, because he knew I could run there after the 90, uh, 90, 1990 census. And he said, you can win anywhere. Well, we found that fact. That wasn't true. There are limits. You can run anywhere. You're beloved everywhere. Uh, the Long Beach press teller is going to tear my face off. They're going to bring up everything from my past. They're going to ruin me. And he said, uh, and my dad will get a heart attack. So I said, no, Dana, I'm declaring Friday in front of John Wayne statue. This would have been December of 91. I went home, and I started thinking about it, and I said, Sally, I'm going to call Dana's mother. I don't want his dad to have a heart attack. He's a great Marine Corps fighter pilot. Sally says, don't call. My brothers called it. Don't call. My sons, my family, everybody said, don't call. But I'm obstinate. I called. Fluffy answered the phone. Lovely, sweet voice. She's in heaven, I'm sure. And I said, Fluffy, uh, oh, my second favorite congressman to my son. I said, Fluffy, would Colonel Don get a heart attack and die if uh, Dana had to run in Long Beach where he's already been an incumbent? For uh, six, four years, he'd win easily, and he would have won easily. And there was this long pause, and she said, the colonel would probably die of a heart attack if Dana had a rough primary. I don't know if he primed her. And I said, Fluffy, tell Dana he can have the safe seat. I'll take the rough, brutal seat that's Democrat, and because I'd always represented Democrat seats, and I took it. Now, everybody thinks that because I gave him the safe seat that somehow this is a grudge match or that ego's involved. I wished him well. I'd endorsed him at 88. His wonderful father told me my mind was the key endorsement. Without Bob Dorton, he wouldn't have beat a popular, entrenched, liberal to moderate Republican, Harriet Weider. She'd been there a long time. She had all the money. He said, your endorsement, Ollie North helped, but he was still under the cloud of Contragate. He said, your endorsement won it for my son. I, I endorsed him in 88. I endorsed him in 90. After I gave him the seat, I enthusiastically endorsed him in 92, in 94, and 96. And all the time we're serving together, these eight years, from 88 to 96, I have no idea what he's doing. This renegade operation. Because I'm going over to these same countries, classified trips, many of them, going into the embassies, meeting with the ambassador, his country team, going into the bubble, which is the sound proof room in every embassy where the CIA talks to you. Because I was on the Intelligence Committee, it was kind of a, a, an impressive thing when there'd be six congressmen or eight or me alone, and suddenly a voice with the ambassadors would say, Congressman Norman, would you please come? People say, what's that about? Well, he's on the Intelligence Committee. He gets the CIA briefing. I'd go into the bubble, and I had two objectives. Oversight. Are they doing the right job? And I had some problems there sometimes. But mostly it was, what can I do to help you? Are you funded? Are you getting enough money? Do you have enough electronic equipment? I was the chairman of tactical and technical intelligence. Everything from secret stuff in oceans, underground and everything, up to the big KH-11 uh, satellite, the Big Bird. So I said, Eric, are we supporting you enough? How about the budget? There were liberal Democrats always screaming, like Kerry of Massachusetts, to expose the intelligence budget, to cut it back. My job was to go on the floor and defend the secret couldn't tell the number, budget of the of the CIA and all the intelligence agencies. The Let next. me ask you a question here. Sure. Was Rohrbacher taking these trips to Afghanistan and visiting the Taliban on his own kick without any government approval? No government approval, no government cooperation, no reporting to the government, without even the knowledge of the Intelligence Committee, without sitting next to me on the floor and saying, Bob, you're just back from Afghanistan on intel trip. I was there myself mucking around with uh, General Massoud, the Lion of the Panjir Valley. I didn't know any of this Walter Mitty stuff that he was going through. And then I got calls from friends of his and from people in the Jewish community, from people in both parties. Can you control this guy? 
Yes. I said, well, he's not a friend. He's an acquaintance. We've never had lunch, never had dinner. Uh, I, he was a bachelor most of the time I knew him. I've never had lunch with him, even in the house dining room. I don't know what he does. He serves. I don't know what he does. He doesn't fly any jet airplanes the way I do as a congressman. He doesn't know anything about armed service. He's not like his dad. I don't know him that well. And they said, well, something's wrong. And I said, well, it seemed okay the eight years I was there with him. And then I started to see what the trips were. They were starting to come out. Then he stood on a stage and got an Arab hero medal with Earl Hilliard and Cynthia McKinney, two liberal Democrats, and they were both defeated in their primaries. But his primary was behind him, March 5th of 90, not March 5th of uh, 2002. And then I'm watching Alan Keyes, who is a friend, who I have had dinner with, who our wives know one another, and I'm watching the May 2nd, 2002 Alan Keyes show, because I'm pulling for Alan to uh, make this MSNBC show work. And Dane is on there, and you know, guy you serve next to a guy, district to district, our lines interlock. And I'm looking, and all of a sudden I hear him say nine times that the Israeli soldiers target innocent civilians. Both sides commit atrocities. He says that nine times. And then the worst line is, the, the Israeli soldiers slaughter innocent uh, people. Slaughter people. Then he says, the, the leaders on both sides are equally corrupt. And he says, I grant you, Alan, there's atrocities. Yes, the atrocities are bad on Hamas and Hezbollah, but the Israelis do the same thing by policy, by their leaders. Well, that's what Kerry, John Kerry, the senator, going to be the Democratic nominee, said when he came back from Vietnam, because I tracked him for two days in April of 1971. All right, Bob Connors, I watched Bob, him say the same thing. You're cutting, you're cutting into your a lot of important okay. stuff here. We, now we know why you're here. And we know why you're running. Tom, I'm going to put him on here. Because you answered the question I was going to ask Bob, so I'll go to another one. No, no, wait a second. I want to ask a position on term limits for Congressman. What is uh, your position? It's a very simple one. I believe in term limits for everybody. The president has them. The vice president has them. Senators and congressmen are different because we represent 50 different states. And unless everybody does it at once, then all the small states will say, well, we're not going to have term limits, and we're going to have all the chairmanships within 20 years. So unlike California, where I supported term limits, and it clicked in, and most states have it, almost every governor in every one of the 50 states is term limited. But the, the trick, the key, and I fought for it, I was the main spokesman for the U.S. Term Limits Committee, uh, the, the civilian uh, layman group, is how do you get everybody to do it at once? And the problem is the Senate. They lost that long. Bob, let me cut in and ask you a question. Sure. On the contract with America, you co-authored was term limit legislation limiting House members to three terms. Right. As a candidate for the House and having already served nine times uh, quite well, I would say, in that body, how can you explain the decision to run again? Well, uh, first of all, Dane has been there 16 years, and now he has become, let me quote General Lee to his best cavalry commander, Jeb Stewart, Sir, you have become an impediment to me and this army what you're trying to do. Dana Rohrbacher is an impediment to freedom, to his country, to the military. He's wallowing in terrorist money and that trumps anything of what I believe in to limit tenure. This is a one-issue campaign. I would probably stay four years max, probably two, give some younger woman or man a chance, but he's an impediment. He must be taken out of office. All right, let's do a lightning round here on some okay. issues, and uh, we'll expect.